This podcast is supported by the Rebecca Vassi Trust, a UK-based charity which promotes the art of narrative photography through granting bursary awards to up-and-coming photographers and funding public education projects like this one. This podcast has full editorial independence, and the views expressed in this series are not necessarily those of the Trust. Welcome to Season 2 of the Photo Ethics Podcast. I'm your host, Savannah Dodd, and I'm the founder of the Photography Ethics Center. Each week, I'll be talking with an accomplished photographer about the ethics of their practice. Today, in episode number seven, we'll be talking with The Other about class in the industry. The Other is a photography collective working to raise awareness using an intersectional approach to class discrimination within photography in the UK. The team members who founded this collective are photographers, artists, activists, and educators from poor and working class backgrounds. The Other believes that class must be on the agenda throughout the efforts in creating positive change in this industry. Kirsty Mackay, Kelly O'Brien, and Joanne Coates are the founders of The Other. Kirsty Mackay is a Scottish documentary photographer, filmmaker, activist, and educator, whose in-depth research-led practice highlights issues of gender, class, and discrimination. Kelly O'Brien is a visual artist and educator. Her research and creative practice focuses on intersecting issues such as absence, class identity, power, and hidden narratives. Joanne Coates is a working class storyteller who uses the medium of photography. Participation and community are integral to her practice. Her work looks at rurality and class. First of all, thank you so much for being here. It's really, really great to, to have you three uh, on the, the podcast with me. Um, I wonder if we could start maybe by just giving me a little bit of an introduction to each of your own photographic practice, if that would be okay. Joe, would you like to start? Yeah. I'm a working class documentary storyteller using the medium of photography. So my work looks at class and rurality. It's as much about process and it's very much about working with communities and participation as aesthetics. I've been artist in residence at Newcastle University and at Berwick Visual Arts. I work and live in the rural north of England and I work on documentary assignments, artist commissions and again community is core to my practice. That's brilliant. Thanks so much for that, Joe. Kirsty, do you want to tell us a little bit about your practice as well? My name's Kirsty Mackay. I'm an artist and activist. I primarily use documentary photography. I'm originally from Glasgow. Um, my latest work is a long-term project looking at the connection between political policy and our bodies, our health, uh, well-being and life expectancy. My book, The Fish That Never Swam, is going to be published later this year. And that documents a political attack on working class people in Glasgow. That's brilliant. I look forward to, to seeing that come out. What month is it anticipated for? I don't know yet. I'm, no I'm working on it. <laughs> <laughs> right. You'll have to let us know. And Kelly, could you tell us a little bit about your practice? Yeah, sure. My name's Kelly O'Brien and I come from Derby in the East Midlands. I'm an artist educator and mentor. My work mostly focuses on themes around post-memory, working in a way that allows me to create kind of visual transformation and storytelling through looking at my own historical narratives and also looking at theory that connects to that. So, so things such as feminism, politics, class, gender, intergenerational narratives things like that. I'm interested in photography's relationship with absence and with my work I try to investigate how invisibility, immateriality and memory can be used to create new perceptions. I'm interested in the expanded modes of documentary photography and how I can use those to represent the unrepresentable. So 
that's that's my practice. I'm currently working on a body of work which looks at an investigation of my estranged father. The, the work is called Are You There? And my father is deceased. So what I do is I collaborate with Clairvoyance to create a, a new story around his identity and my relationship with him. So yeah, that's me. <laughs> that's brilliant. I wonder, could you tell me, like, how did The Other start? What brought you together? Well, The Other, I think, was an, it was a slow, slow project that came into being. I think I met Kirsty when she came to do a, a lecture and a seminar at the University of South Wales, where I was studying in MA at the time. And we instantly clicked and we naturally started to talk about class. I knew of Kirsty's work before. So we just kind of connected through that common understanding or experience. And I think Kirsty was very aware of Joe's work at the time as well. Yeah, I think Kelly and I really connected, but I was hearing a lot about Joe's work and it just felt like a natural process for all three of us to work together but it was a very slow start just many many conversations and we've not met all three of us have not met we haven't been in the same room together because of covid that's amazing to really be able to come together and and do so much during coronavirus when you haven't even had an opportunity to meet in person it's really remarkable and i think so many things like that have come out of the pandemic you know that that were totally unexpected and created a lot of opportunities for collaborative working because you all aren't also very proximus geographically are you we're based all over the uk so kirsty is in bristol kelly is i want to say the midlands at the moment but not always and I'm in the northeast of England. So we're all pretty sparsely spread out. But I think that actually it has really brought us together and all the conversations that we've had and all the time we've kind of spent talking has actually been a really nice way to form and maybe a bit more considered than if we had have just met and then gone away. Yeah. Do you think that that's been quite different because of the pandemic? Yeah, I think definitely it, it probably has. And even I think that we started off something that I really liked that we did as a kind of a group of people working together was that we always checked in with how each other were and like that that's very much at the core of like what we do is that kind of kindness and we started it with ourselves with each other which I think has been really beneficial. That's brilliant and yeah so kindness definitely and, and checking in with each other is such a a really important thing right now, I think, with the pandemic context, but also really lovely beginnings for something like what you're doing. Could you talk maybe a little bit more about what kinds of things did you identify and what kinds of problems did you want to address through forming the other? In the beginning, I think mostly for the first year, it was a lot of conversations about our lived experiences and we came together to talk about our lived experiences as working class and women photographers who have come from poorer spaces and how that has affected our experiences and our careers or our the ways that we navigate the industry or have experienced kind of, what would you say, microaggressions maybe? or some of the barriers that we've experienced. So when we came together, it was very much just a space of conversation and how we wanted to use our experiences to then create a, a change in the industry. Just to add to that, I think we started off talking about our own experience of navigating the photography industry as a woman, as a working class woman, as a white person, and slowly we've been able to unpick what the obstacles are and make a plan for the change that we want to see. What obstacles were those that you identified in particular? I think in my mind they're twofold. There are the obstacles that we have in our head, things like imposter syndrome, things like a lack of confidence in middle class spaces, 
And then there are the obstacles within the photography industry, which some of those come from it being a middle class dominant space. So work of working class photographers is not valued in the same way. There's the financial obstacles of the pay to play. So that's paying to enter competitions, paying for portfolio reviews. And we've identified a lot of opportunities in the photography industry that are just not inclusive if you're a working class photographer. So there's a kind of trajectory of getting your work out to an audience and establishing yourself as a photographer and getting people to know your name and create a profile. And many of those opportunities are unpaid. So even the photography magazines don't pay to publish your work. So if you're focused on earning a living, that's not really an option that's available to you, as is internships. I think the the UK, there's a a recent statistic that the UK has like the worst social mobility of any country in the world. And I think that's actually increasing. And just building on what Kirsty said, I think being great at photography is admired, but that alone is not enough. You need money, confidence, power, access, networks. You need luck as well. And I think it's really difficult and really complex because class affects so many different people and there's so many kind of like subgroups that it can affect and I think the pandemic has actually really made class divisions and structures clear not only in the UK but worldwide and I still think it's really difficult because I I don't know about everyone else but I've always had this argument of like but you went to university and you left home so you can't be working class but I do feel that's just not true for me And I think it's really difficult because there's less funding for education. And there's also this, like, you have to change who you are to get ahead. And, like, personally, I don't want to be a middle-class liberal. I don't want to lose who I am just to maybe fit it in a place and maybe have success, like, to tell the stories that we all tell we should be ourselves and still have an equal opportunity for that. I think you've put that really well. That's really interesting and useful perspective, I think. And that, that idea that you described of, you know, well, if you went to university, you must be middle-class is very simplistic, isn't it? Simplistic view of, of what class is. And you spoke about needing to be yourself and what that brings to the work. You know, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that, about the value of different perspectives as well, and, and what's missing right now and where those holes are in the industry. Kelly, do you want to, I want to thank Kelly, because the other day we had a talk and she was really brilliant talking about this you might not want to but if you want to what did we talk about joe when we were talking about those questions i can't remember it was like why are you photographing people like what are you getting Mm. out of it it was like is it for your personal elevation or is it for social change yeah i think if we look at the industry on the whole and if we look at When I went to university, so when I went, I think I was in my early 20s when I went to uni. And I only managed that because I came from a poor household. So I could get the full grant and I could get the full bursary and loan. So that allowed me to go into what was a predominantly middle class space. I don't believe that universities should be these elitist spaces, but they're becoming more and more there's not as many poor or working class students in university settings at the moment. And I think just coming from that, where if people are studying photography and studying documentary photography and making work around communities or people who are marginalised or people who are coming from a different positioning in society than yourself so if we if we go back to that university setting say where the majority of people the majority of photographers are students are middle class and they are making work around say working class communities there's going to be an issue there because they're going to be coming in with a 
with an understanding of a visual discourse which is only from their own perspective. So Kirsty coined this middle class gaze. And I feel like this needs to be challenged in universities as well. And I know some educators and students are doing it, but this needs to be really dismantled. Like, look at your own positioning as a photographer and, you know, what story are you telling? Who are you representing? Who's missing? And what kind of things, your own assumptions and your own kind of understandings of the world, how that plays out in the people that you're working with or the communities that you're working with. And I think like, for example, if when I work with people from my own communities, I, I work a lot, I photograph a lot on the council estate where my mum lives. It's like I, I come into these spaces with a different understanding, a more nuanced understanding. Obviously, I can still get things wrong. I'm still like an outsider in some ways because the minute I start pointing the camera at people in my community, it puts me in a different positioning. And I think it just really needs to be dismantled in the sense like, why why do we feel like we need to make these bodies of work as well? So if I feel like I need to make these bodies of work to one, understand where I'm from and I feel like it's important to represent the people within my community. But also, I feel like it's a responsibility of mine to do that because I want to challenge the dominant visual discourses which are coming out, the dominant kind of bodies of work which are coming out around working class communities, which I find quite harmful. I find like they're misinformed. And that's largely because the people who are making that work aren't coming from those communities and they don't have a deeper understanding of what it's like to be poor and working class. So I don't believe that it should be segregated completely. I just feel like there needs to be a, a deeper education and knowledge when we're working with, when people are working with communities which aren't theirs. There's going to be power issues, there's going to be ethical issues and I think that really needs to be looked at. Does that make sense? Absolutely. No, that I think that's okay. really, really well put. And there's so much in that to unpack. But I, I know Kirsty and, and Joe want to want to get in there. So go, go ahead, Kirsty. Photography's always been very good at portraying victims and not as good at portraying the perpetrators. And if you are looking at poverty, for instance, through a middle class lens, it's easy to miss out a lot of the nuances and tell a very single-sided story. And I think that's where poverty porn comes from, is from a a middle-class gaze. I feel like there's this, like, a lot of photos follow this right-wing ideology, and I don't know whether we're taught that because of media portrayals, media portrayals that we're seeing, we're taught before university, before visual literacy becomes part of our kind of language but photographers like photographers and photographs can work to like repress people through misrepresentation and I really feel like there's this vicious cycle of like what a person thinks they are what they really are what society thinks they are and then who the person in power says they are and then how that affects them so if someone is telling you that you're this and photographing you as that and representing you as that then just that feed into how you feel about yourself. I'm also really aware of the middle class audience and when I've shown my Glasgow work to certain middle class people in the photography industry they've said to me you're not showing enough and what they really mean by that is you know you're not showing kids with dirty faces. You're not showing people living in damp, untidy houses. But that's actually, poverty doesn't look like that anymore. But that's the kind of appetite that a middle-class audience has for that subject. I totally agree with Kirsty there as well, because I feel like there's this thing of, and that comes from misrepresentation, but actually... And I don't know whether like you two find this the same as well, but actually poor people, if someone was coming into the house, they would make it spotless. They would try, they know the thoughts around them. So they would almost like be putting more effort into something. So I do find those portrayals 
either misleading or people are going and looking for them or it's they're not having prolonged interactions like they're in the street and they're almost like you know it's it's like that I hate the word shooting photography but it's that's what it's doing it's like quickly turning your lens on someone and getting that moment that picture that you want because you've seen a representation and then leave it and they're not spending a prolonged time with that community and understanding them yeah I agree I think when we think about visual discourses around the poor and the working class and when I say like visual discourses I mean the way we decode and understand the meaning of what those visuals mean in photography and how they're intended to represent and how the audience kind of interprets them so if we think about harmful images and harmful image making when the feedback that we're getting about these poorer communities or vulnerable communities and which are violent they're portraying victims they're showing suffering they're showing this lifestyle which is impoverished and what that does it feeds back into this ideology that the the poorer classes in society are I don't know what the word would be but it's like that moral black and white like bad versus good like really simplistic not understanding the complexities of the situation yeah exactly and what I find is that I just yes I come from a poor working class space and because of poverty there has been hardship and there has been suffering and there has been roughness but it's not just that there's so many so many deeper nuanced amazingly rich cultural brilliant things that are part of my community and part of my upbringing and the fact that I grew up in poverty means that there is structural violence and there is issues that come with that that have affected my family and the wider community and yes that needs to be talked about in photography and in literature and in film but it's not just as simple as that there's many 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 different branches to our lives and I just don't see that often enough in photography that represents people like me or people like I know and I think that's because there's profit to be made in the suffering of others and images of suffering and I think there's glamorization and dramatization in those works because people fetishize it and also want to see it there's this kind of urge to see I think there's something deeper in the brain of seeing the people suffering and I think it sells as well I think suffering sells I think there's a kind of almost car crash mentality when you know you see something and you actually can't look away there's something something in that about wanting to see these kinds of images of poverty. And Joe, going back to your what we said before, thinking about why, as photographers, why we need to take these images, what are we adding to and how do they function in society? I mean, the arts are supposed to be a left-thinking, a liberal space, but what I see is there's a lot of people calling themselves liberal, but people acting kind of a, a very right-wing way. And if we don't dismantle our own practices and say, well, actually what I'm making and the work that I'm making is going out into the world and just reinforcing these ideas and ideologies about the poor and working classes, that doesn't add up to me. We have to practice what we preach. We can't just say that we're liberal artists and then create work that goes against that. Absolutely. I feel like one of the things that is really coming out when I'm listening to you talk about this is, and this is something that I I think I bring up a lot because I think it's a really complicated question, but the, the idea of audience responsibility, you know, how can we be more responsible audiences and what onus is on the middle-class audience looking at photographs of the working class? Like what does the audience need to do differently? How, how do we be better audiences? And is the responsibility on the audience or is the responsibility on the image makers or does it lie somewhere in between? I'd say the responsibility is along the whole chain. 
It comes from the photographer of asking yourself those questions. Am I the right person to be telling this story? The responsibility comes from the writer that's writing about the work. It comes from the picture editor and their selection of images. It comes from newspaper editors who then frame that work and put a headline on it. And it comes down to the audience as well. I think it's really important and something, I don't know how to kind of like frame it, but sometimes the audience that we think of or that photography pictures have worked with is very narrow. It's other photographers or people who've studied. Or, and I'm like, if your work is about something that's addressing ethics in, in any way and it's really looking at that and it's about social change or it's about important issues, where is that work? going and what is it doing and how are you making sure that that community has some kind of say that they can see the work are you doing something alongside maybe it goes you know as an assignment but maybe you think about showing it within that community and having an engaging workshop where people can speak about how they feel that those images are representing them and maybe you do that before you show it so you can gain some understanding from them as well you know there's little things that we can do and I think it's so important to also think how do I make that audience available to people who aren't usually included in photography in the arts? Yeah, I, th- I think that there needs to be a conscious process throughout and that connects to what Kirsty says. It, it goes to the image maker, it goes to the publisher, to the editor, to the, the newspaper, to the gallery. And I feel that in an ideal world, everyone would be you know, working on this critical consciousness of their own. But it's not the case at the moment. It's not a practice that is happening throughout the industry. And this is why it's really important that we don't just create echo chambers when we hold conferences or, or workshops or talks. I think for us, or for me personally, I think for us to be able to work effectively and make deep change throughout means that the editors and the the gallery owners and the the curators they're the people that we need to be speaking to not just the photography community or photographers because it can become this echo chamber we have to have uncomfortable conversations and if people really want change to happen which I'm sure people really do I think it's just sometimes it's really difficult to see the shift or how that shift would work but I think we need to go straight into the industry and have conversations and consultation with people who are the gatekeepers and who are making the, yeah, making the industry work. It needs to be directly to them for me personally. So spaces need to be created on all levels. And I think, yeah, what Joe said about creating spaces in galleries as well and community spaces to discuss the work and have conversations around, especially if you're working with marginalised communities, I think like it's really important that they're there and they own the spaces just as much as the photographers do. You know, a lot of the time it's like the photographer will go in and make the work and then it's theirs. But actually it's not, is it? It's like the people that you've been working with, it's theirs, actually. Building on what Kelly says, Schroeder, he has this really interesting way of talking about the gaze, and he he talks about the gaze, it's more than just looking, it signifies a psychological relationship of power, and what he means by that is the gazer is superior to the object of the gaze, and I think that's what we're kind of talking about. And if you're the audience... Are you given that kind of superiority and does that build into stereotypes? And do you have to ask yourself questions around that? And sometimes if you are in a gallery or a space where something isn't sitting right and you know that maybe the pairing of images is is wrong or it's speaking about something that could really misrepresent someone, maybe that's a conversation that the audience can have with somebody in the gallery and say, like, this doesn't sit right with me. I think there's small things that we can all do as individuals that if we all did them would have a bigger impact. Absolutely. No, I I think that that's definitely useful. So you you spoke a a bit about conscious image making. And I was wondering, you know, if you could elaborate a little bit on what you mean by conscious image making. And I know there's this underpinning philosophy that conscious image making is a political act. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more 
about how that plays out and how you see that? I suppose conscious image making to me is that process of asking yourself many, many questions. In the Glasgow work that I made the whole way through, I was asking myself, who am I to tell this story? I'm telling a story of a place and it is the place that I was born and I grew up in, but also I've moved away. And I was also going into communities within Glasgow that I had no connection to. And I think that's inherently problematic in documentary photography when you go into a community and generally what you take with you is assumptions about that community. And so conscious image making is finding those solutions to breaking down those assumptions. Chris Killip talked about it and his solution was to spend a lot of time in one place. My solution is to listen to people. And when I'm photographing people, I'm not doing it from a vantage point of looking down on people. When I'm photographing people, I'm in awe of the people that I'm photographing and I'm learning from them and I'm listening to them. And one instance that I can talk about in my own work is when I went to Castle Milk, which is a housing estate on the edge of Glasgow. And I came in at the beginning of the project with all this academic research. And I was really passionate about this and I felt like I had the answers. But actually I was taking this into someone's house that had lived this experience. And what I had was, I think I sounded arrogant and what I had there was ego. And this woman really set me straight. But that's the kind of problems we have when we're making work about other communities. And I think what we're not saying is that we're not saying middle class people cannot make work about working class people. But we are saying it's so important how you do that. You're not giving working class people a voice. Working class people have a strong voice. You're not empowering people. You know, that's really overstating your role and people empower themselves. I feel like a lot of times there's a lot of conversation in the photography industry about the ethics of how we treat the people that we're photographing, but there isn't as much conversation about the ethics of how we treat each other within the industry. I think that's definitely something that's not unpacked enough. We don't treat each other with the same care. And I really appreciate what you're saying about that. And I think we're just missing a space that's non-judgmental and compassionate. You know, a lot of the discussion, especially right now in the middle of the pandemic when we can't get together, is going on on Twitter. And that is definitely not the place for compassion. I think when we came together as a group, you know, for that first year of putting our ideas and our thoughts and our fears and our frustrations and, you know, it was quite a raw place a lot of the time when we used to have conversations because we found a place where we could be honest. And I would say that we practised compassion and kindness within that space. You know, bring what you have and it, it's all welcome, even if it's uncomfortable. Like, And I think through that, we have, me personally, through joining the other, has made me feel more comfortable in my own skin as a working class photographer because I know the support and there's connection and there's shared realities and experiences and that's been met with compassion and kindness but that same situation hasn't necessarily been met in the photography world because to get into the photography industry that trajectory of becoming part of it or getting an identity or a place within it. Like, it's not easy if you're poor and you have other commitments, if you have to go to work, if you have no money, if you can't pay to play. And I would say that there's a lot of sacrifices that have been made. I would say that I've made and I would say that the other girls have made as well. And with that comes a lot of mental health stuff as a result because it is a constant struggle. So I think being able to create a space where we see each other in that struggle has been amazing. 
and yeah definitely I think having a group and knowing that you have support before I was in the other I remember doing talks and talking about class and the thing with classes it does annoy some people because they think of oh class doesn't exist and if you kind of have statistics or show up and talk against that you can get a lot of quite angry feedback to that and if you're on your own that is quite difficult whereas if you have a group where you can talk about that and talk how to deal with that do you need a day off and there's three of us so if someone is having a hard time there's two other people who can do that work and carry on with something there's that support system and I think something we've all done is you know if there was a conversation where someone was quiet call someone and As an organisation, obviously that maybe isn't going to work for everybody, but I think going forward, a compassionate approach to not only your photographic image making, but maybe collectives you're part of or groups, or if you work for an organisation, is definitely a way forward. Absolutely. And you said earlier as well about how the types of shifts that maybe need to happen in the industry are uncomfortable for people or people aren't prepared for it or don't know what it looks like to maybe create a more inclusive photography industry. I was wondering if you could maybe talk about what does it look like? What are the things that need to happen? And what things do you hope to see going forward? One thing I'd really like to talk about is education. And I know Kirstie and Kelly have really valuable insights to this as well. But I would really like to see, I guess, visual arts education put in place at a younger age with poorer and working class families. So maybe that we've we've kind of talked about things that we could do and, and how would that change. And I mentor with the Girls Network and one of the statistics that I got from them really made me like, I think that that needs to happen. So it's less than 6% of girls from the poorest homes across the UK actually make it into higher education. So less than 6% is a tiny, tiny number. And kind of thinking... A lot of those people won't even know what a photographer is. I didn't know that a photographer was a job or that an artist was a job or a curator. It just wasn't, there wasn't anyone in the community who did that, who even knew some of those words. You know, I remember kind of coming home and talking about my practice and people were like, are you, are you going to be a doctor? Like they just did, it's not, it's not words that people understand or associate in those communities. And um, so I think education and workshops for young people is really important and listening to working class people so if working class people say it's really hard for me to access this opportunity it's really hard for me to feel safe in this space and understood like listen to them and think like well what can we do does that mean that as an organization maybe we have like a group where we bring people together and consult on things that are people from all different backgrounds And I think another thing I would say as well is that different marginalised groups are often divided. So we need to like have an alliance with other groups and other movements and all kind of understand each other. So that could be queer photographers, BIPOC photographers, women photographers, disabled photographers, non-binary photographers, all different people who have all different issues and to understand that together we're stronger and we can make a point about how something is inaccessible to people and what points the same and what makes it harder for someone else as well. I think that we often, we've done a few talks now and we're often asked for an answer to how we want the photo industry to change. And I think, you know, we don't have the answers, but we don't have like the full vision because I think it needs to be a collective effort like Joe says, everyone needs to work together, but space needs to be made for different people and different voices and different experiences. And I think until that happens, I do believe that there's really, really good people in the industry and most people want change, but maybe it's just so obscure, like it's just, it's so abstract at the moment. And I think we just need to take risks we need to create conversations and we need consultation from different members of the photographic community. And people need to let go of their power. And I think that's the difficult one. How can that happen? 
you know, because when we're in an industry where everyone's competing and fighting for crumbs, we want to hold on to what little bit we have of it. But I think, you know, maybe I'm just being a bit idealistic, but I do believe that if there's spaces created for conversation and risk taking and experimentation, it could be really, really interesting. All it can do is improve and be more, more interesting in the long run. But I feel we're at this crossroads of people want to make change, but don't really know how or aren't willing to hand over power. And I think we've spoken a lot about how we can be part of that change. And I think like something that we're really interested in is using our platform to help others. But to do that, we need people in the industry. We need to partner with people so that we can use their platform, a more powerful platform. So it needs to be like a tier system. People need to open their spaces in the industry for us so then we can use our platforms for other people if that makes sense I mean that's a really good point but I want that to be articulated really well can anyone do that so the other is a small community and there's lots of small groups or communities out there that are run and maybe not funded and they don't have a lot of power they make small changes in small areas that are really important and they're small worthwhile changes but to make larger changes we and maybe other groups as well really need to partner with organisations and institutions that have more power to ensure that larger change is made. Yeah, so I think what we're looking for are institutions and organisations within the photography industry to partner with us and platform the work we're doing so we can make the most effective change. So start emailing us. (laughs) What we found is that the issue of class isn't even on the table. So I think that's what we can do is make sure that we do start to discuss the issue of class and unpick all the barriers that are in the way. And I would say, building on Kirsty's point, like maybe someone's listening and they're thinking that class isn't real or like what difference will it make if we work with working class people or if they get to tell their stories like what's what's the kind of point and I'd say if you're asking those questions that you need to check your privilege and your assumptions and your stereotypes and you don't see the need for a reason as well. So where would you recommend people maybe who aren't as class conscious to start what resources would be useful for people to familiarize themselves with or where should they go to learn? about maybe gaps in their own knowledge? There's a really good programme on at the minute that Kirsty recommended to us to watch, and that's Class Wars with Darren McGarvey. Is that how you say it? And that's on BBC Scotland, but you can watch it across the UK and maybe wider, but I'm not sure. There's lots of kind of people who write. So Kit Diwal is a writer, a UK writer. She's amazing and writes really well on Class There's a book called Know Your Place, which has essays from working class writers. There's lots of working class writers coming through that are really speaking about important issues. So there is Kerry Hudson. She's a writer and she wrote about poverty and how it affected her and then how going into adult life from living in hostels, from not having a home and having a really difficult time. And there's a panic, which is if you want more like academic statistics, if you put panic PDF into Google, it has statistics on class. It was a big survey conducted, so it really looked at class and the arts. So that's a really good resource if you need those statistics and figures and numbers. I had a couple questions that I was just wanting to sort of double back to. The first one is, I think, Kirsty, you were talking about, you know, the objective isn't through your photography. You're not giving people a voice. Like, that's not what's happening. And I think that's such an important point, you know, this overstating of the role of the photographer. But I was wondering if you could maybe then talk about what is the objective of doing photography work, especially with marginalized communities? What are the aims? What can we do through that process? I think looking at the objective and your own reasons for documenting a subject is really, really important. What we see quite often is 
middle class photographers making a story about working class people, not really to raise awareness of an issue, but really for themselves, you know, and for their own ego and to elevate their status within photography. So I think as a photographer, you have to believe that photography can bring about change. That's my motivation. I want to make photographs that are going to influence political policy. And you can like you can work with academics, or you can work with organisations. If people are like, how does my work have influence? But I'm not giving someone a voice. You can work with all different organisations in different ways to do that. So you might be more powerful if you can work with an organisation or each project you do. I would say you should definitely be doing a lot of like groundwork before taking a photo. So like, even if it's a photo assignment, I'll have like a research document with 60 pages. I've spoken to five people on the phone and maybe this is why like, I never have any money, but like, but it's, I feel like that's just the basics of what you should be doing before kind of just going in there. And whereas I know a lot of people are like, well, I just turn up and then, but if, if it's a complex situation with marginalised groups or a complex social situation or ethics really need to be considered, I would say there's a lot of groundwork and picking up the hub phone and having a conversation with an organisation that has done multiple kind of surveys. They know other groups, they know how to safeguard, they have kind of raised issues around that, then maybe they're the first people that you should be speaking to. And really, I think as well, looking at safeguarding options on different groups of people as well is really important. I think it's important to think about what your purpose is and where you fit in to the bigger picture. And in the work I made in Glasgow, it was actually quite easy for me to see what my purpose could be. And it's very research-based, this work. And I identified my purpose as the person that can go into different communities and connect people's personal experience with uh, academic research. So it was quite easy to see in that instance, but I also find it really useful to think about what I can do as an individual. You know, when we're talking about big issues, it's overwhelming and it's easy to think, well, there's nothing I can do that's going to make any difference. But if we focus on what we can do, the small things that we can each do as individuals to make a difference, I find that really helpful. Yeah, I think believing in that photography can create change is really important. But I don't believe only photography can create change. And as the photographer, the author of the work that we're not these gods of making change, you know, like we can create conversations and we can create dialogue and hopefully new discourses. But I do worry sometimes about, and I've been guilty of this in my past, I spent a lot of years working in Europe with no borders and migrant solidarity campaigns and really frontline stuff and often using photography And I think there's a fine line of this saviour complex that we can experience. And even in my own communities when I'm working, I don't believe that my photography is going to radically change the people's lives that I'm working with, because actually it's bigger than me and it's bigger than the work. It's systemic, it's problematic capitalist oppression. And the least we can do with our work, if it's done well, is create important conversations in different areas so Kirsty's work for example can be taken into I would classify her work to be educational and also important documents of social history that can be taken into spaces not just the art world but also you know the government or councils or charities to start creating dialogues and the same with your work Joe, that you represent the rural working class, something that we hardly see. And I think these works at their best are just pieces that can open up doors to wider discussions. But I think we need to be very careful as photographers that we need to really watch ourselves and keep track of ourselves, not believing that we can save the world through our photography only, (laughs) because we can't. Like, it's just impossible. (laughs) 
I think it's about accepting the limitations of photography and working with lots of other people to bring about change. And I think it's really important to manage the expectations of the people you're working with. So sometimes it's a really complex situation. I've worked with people who are unhoused and they've said, well, will this mean that someone will get me out? Like in a joking way, someone will get me a house, but like underneath it, there is that, will this change my life? And I'm kind of like, I don't think it will. Like down the line, maybe that will lead to questions and discourse, like Kelly said, that will. But straight, and you have to be honest with people and say from the start what you're doing and what it can and can't do for them. Absolutely. And I, I think that kind of connects to another question that I wanted to double back to, which was about, I think you mentioned this, Kelly, about how your role when you're working in your own community as a photographer, how your role also shifts and the role of being a photographer carries its own power. And I was wondering if you could just elaborate on that a little bit and how you negotiate that or navigate that. Yeah, I think for me, interestingly, it mirrors without photography in the mix. It just mirrors kind of how I'm treated in my community anyway now, since I left to go to university two times to do a BA and an MA. And then when I come back here, I I do a lot of my work here, but I'm not always here. And when I do come back, it's like... I'm part of the community, but I'm someone that really isn't because I talk a bit different now. I've lost my proper regional accent. You know, they say, oh, you talk posh now, posh Kelly and things like that. But I don't because when I'm with my middle class friends or not in the area, everyone says I've got a, an accent and I'm, you know, I'm a bit more common than they are because I've got a lot of mates who are middle class. So it's like, it mirrors for me how my class identity plays out in society and then it also when I'm a photographer making work in my community it's the same because the minute I start observing my community commenting on them kind of unpicking deconstructing I'm already an outsider for doing that because I'm not just in it I'm not just living it I have to take an objective look on it and I think it's difficult because I feel like a big anxiety and then a big responsibility to represent and make work well. And a lot of the work that I'm doing in my community isn't seen. I'm not publishing it. I'm not showing it because I'm not completely comfortable with it yet. And I think that's something for me to resolve. I think because it's people that I've grown up with as well and I've known them since I was young, it's very different. I don't know how that would be if I was going into another working class community making work as an outsider of that community. Because even though, you know, I might be from a council estate and from a poor background, it doesn't mean that I know all the nuances of every council estate or every poor community. You know, it's very different. So I think, again, it just comes down to being aware and being conscious And not just holding everything to yourself, like sharing work and being open to criticism as well with your peers and people that you trust. I think it's never clear cut. I think there's people that would look at my work and call it poverty porn and they have done. But I know it's not poverty porn because I'm not telling a one sided story. And there's elements of my work that I feel still quite uncomfortable with. So it's never black and white. It's never clear cut. And I think the best you can do is to satisfy your own conscience and to really honour the people that you're photographing and ask their opinion of it and for their consent in every part of the process. I think consent's a massive thing there. And in my own practice, I work a lot with my family and consent is still essential, you know? Just because they're my family and I'm so deeply close to them doesn't mean that I can't exploit them for my own needs or visions of image making. Like I think consent throughout needs to be thorough. I think this question of consent really ties in to the last question I have for you, which is what does photography ethics mean to you as a group or individually? I think individually ethics should be at the core of your practice. So the last time I was on assignment, it was 
a subject that's really close to me and that I kind of find difficult. So it was about homelessness and about mental health and male suicide. And so it was quite how you handle that. You have to be very ethical. You have to do a lot of research and again, safeguarding. And I protected the identities of everyone involved, changed names and photographed them in a way that they cannot be seen, identifiable more than seen. But also what struck me was that talking to them, they said they had let someone else kind of come and speak to them before, but they told them about their story in like really personal details. And they'd just been so, you know, they were so focused on, I've got to get this information from this person they were so blunt with them that it was actually quite a traumatic experience and I think ethically being aware of things that we do can be a traumatic experience for someone obviously that's quite an extreme example of people who might have had PTSD and that can be triggering for them but I think considering and and really looking at the actions that photography can have on other people is really important and as a group I think ethics is something that we really talk about quite a lot as in before we do a talk we discuss how that's going to be manageable will it be difficult for people to access what should we talk about and we kind of really look at different issues and how they're going to affect people and that's something that I've really found helpful being in part of this group is that I think Kelly and Kirstie are both very considerate towards that so that makes it a group that I want to be part of I think ethics for us as well, I'll speak for all of us, is an openness to learning, but more importantly, unlearning. Unlearning is challenging and difficult. And I feel to be ethical as an organisation as well, we need to be willing to learn from others, to get other people involved, but also be open to criticism because we're not going to be doing everything perfect. We will make mistakes. And I'm sure we'll make many mistakes, but that we have to invite and welcome in that dialogue. And I think that's why it's really important, like what Joe said about connecting to other groups which are doing the work, you know, and to do that and to be open to that and to be able to to unlearn what we know and what we've taken for granted because of our positionings in society and our lived experiences and the privileges that we do have. For me, that's what being ethical is, is to constantly, which is tiring, but, you know, we are committed to doing the work, is to constantly have a look at how we're acting and the way we think and how that plays out in not just our own practices, our image making, but also our work together as a group. Ethics for me in photography in terms of making work is it really boils down to putting the person you're photographing or the community you're photographing putting their needs and requirements on a par with yours and it's about that releasing of power and being willing to not use an image if the person in the picture does not want you to use that you know, not assuming that you have a right over anybody else. Absolutely. And is there anything that I didn't ask you today but should have asked you? Or anything that we didn't cover that you wanted to make sure was said? I did want to mention funding. It's a small thing. But I think the issue of funding comes into, you know, is the photography industry meritocratic and... With funding in particular, if you have a thousand pounds that you can spare to work with a grant writer, then it's easy to get money. You know, if you have money, it's easy to make money. And I know some photographers who boast about their funding applications and their success rate. And I think I would just love people to look at their privilege a little bit more. And building on what Kirsty said there. I think funding in the UK, not always, but often comes from Arts Council England. And Arts Council England is a public fund. And the main people who are accessing it are middle class image makers, artists. But that is a public fund. And the majority of that money comes from working people. And so that's really difficult. I think that's something that I find really hard or at odds is that that's a system in place to make artists able to practice. 
and it's continuously taken advantage of by, you know, using things like grant lighters, but also people who think that they deserve it, which who is often not working class people. And it's often taken advantage of by the connections that people have, knowing that they know someone high up and that they can use them as a reference or use them to help them with their application. Or, like Kirsty said, to pay someone to do it for them. And what that means is that it becomes this system where it's giving money to people who don't really need it. And obviously artists should get paid for what they do, photographers should get paid for what they do. But I think it's really important to look at that specific funding body and to know that it is funded mainly by working people. And how ethical is that in your practice? And with that, I think something that we want to really get on with as an organisation now is to start lobbying toward festivals and competitions and the opportunities that you have to pay to be part of there should be wavered or free spaces for people for photographers and artists to apply for things I know for fact that lots of people don't apply for things because of the fees whether it's 15 or 25 or 30 pounds And that might not seem a lot of money to some people, but actually that could be someone's bills or weekly shopping. It's a lot of money for some people. So I think there should be a different system set up in that where people with money can also sponsor or pay in kindness for people who don't have the money to apply. Because as artists, we need exposure. And a lot of the time, exhibitions... And shows and festivals give us the exposure that we need to build our careers as a part of it. So that's something that we really want to crack on with, actually, is to start contacting these people and getting wavered or free submission fees. And I think if you weren't in the photography industry, you'd think it was an industry that's based on talent. Um, And some people say all you have to do is make good work and... Um, it'll find its audience but that's it's just not true it's not based on talent you need the money you need the money to play thank you very much for listening to this episode of the photo ethics podcast the aim of this podcast is to share new insights about photography ethics with others so if you heard something you liked please share this podcast with someone who would appreciate it The links to all things mentioned in this episode are available in the show notes at www.photoethics.org. Join me next week when we hear from Polly Urungu on Working Intentionally. If you're enjoying this podcast, why don't you check out our online courses? We've developed a series of three online courses designed specifically for photojournalists and documentary photographers. We discuss questions like, how do we achieve accuracy in our photographs? What's the relationship between power and consent? And when, if ever, should we intervene? These online courses come with perks, like access to an online community group for discussion and Q&A opportunities with me, the course leader. Enroll today at www.photoethics.thinkific.com or go to www.photoethics.org and click Online Courses. This podcast was edited by Ellie Gascoigne.